Welcome to the Reaching Eden podcast. Uh, this is a podcast involving the development team of Gears of Eden, uh, an indie space adventure game that explores a world of sentient machines. Today we have Sledge, our creator director. How are you doing, Sledge? Hi, doing well. Cool. Uh, and then we have Eric, who's the lead writer for the game. Eric? Hello. And we have uh, our special guest back with us, uh, Nick, who is also a writer for the game. Hey. And rounding it out is me, Michael, and I help manage the project. Uh, in this episode of Reaching Eden, we'll be updating you on the progress of our game, uh, share some of the inspirations that we found, and discuss some of the games we've played. We hope you enjoy the podcast as you laugh, learn, and maybe find some inspiration to help you reach your own Eden. So we got so we got uh, some exciting things for the Gears of Eden updates for this week. Probably the biggest thing we have going on right now is the short stories that Eric has been working on. So any uh, any cool stuff you can uh, share with the short stories we got going on so far? Oh yeah. So um, a couple weeks ago, we started working on the uh, short stories in which we detailed like little parts of the world that you might not see or you might end up seeing as you're playing. Um, they're not necessarily tied like right to the moment of the gameplay, but it informs sort of the experiences that you'll be having. Um, and this first one was a really interesting experience. I write in a more like long form format in which you can kind of linger on a topic for an extended period of time. Um, that is not the case at all in a short story. You have, <laughs> yeah, <That's true. laughs> you have like 10, maybe 20, if you're really pushing it, pages. And Sledge, you'll notice that uh, I have, like it's been on for nearly 5,000 words, which is yeah long. <laughs> We're yeah, it dial. was longer than I was anticipating. Well, so so also the thing is, is you know, you say ten twenty pages, but all when it comes down to it, you can just make the font a lot smaller, right? So you can fit. Yeah, so more. we're gonna. <laughs> it's gonna be like three pages, nothing crazy, um, size three font. No, uh, <laughs> we're probably gonna cut a lot out of it. There's already like multiple paragraphs where I'm like, that is unnecessary. I was just figuring out the situation. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but like by the end of it. I there was this product that like again it needs editing it needs work that's what we're working on right now, but it's a it's really fun it has a nice little like thing to it that's not even yeah, I'm a writer and I can't think of words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, you're using all for the short stories. Yeah, I'm using I am using all of my <laughs> good words for the short stories. <laughs> yeah, use them up. <laughs> I hope so because it sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so that's cool, and, and I and I feel like it's also kind of like a, just a great mental exercise in preparation for when we uh, start having to nail down some of the uh, finer details for you know the actual game story. Oh yeah, like as I was writing, I was figuring out like cultural relationships between different, not even like well, not, uh, I guess cultures of uh, machines, but just different like types of machines, like different models. Mm -hmm interact in different ways because of what they are programmed with. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I had, after reading it, um, you know, and then playing the, the game after that, like, it's already changed my approach to how I view the world that I'm <laughs> in. So I can definitely see, like, from the player perspective, how, you know, having a series of these stories will help, like, really set the framework for this world that you're in and, like, provide some context to some of the things that you might see or come across in the game. Like, like even in the just most basic level. So um, I was excited to read the first draft and uh, just like the characters that you, you created, I thought you did a great job. And uh, like, I, I really um, enjoyed seeing where they went in the story and was excited, like <laughs> as I was reading it to find out what happened. And um, so, yeah, we're, I think we're, you know, probably a couple edits away from getting that released. And yeah. um, I think you're waiting for me right now to finish up some of my, <laughs> my feedback and stuff, but um, I think it's a great start. And so we're excited um, I think it's a good start for, you know, hopefully a continuing series. So yeah. Good job. Keep it Thank up. you very much. And so I think it's very good because it gets people excited to kind of, you know, play the game, see what kind of uh, like future possibilities. And I, I think it's great when you get people's oh, yeah. mind just like they like starts uh, going and they start coming up with their own perceptions of what they can be. And then and then and then when they start playing the game, then, you know, it, it could be that conflict or it can be that like smooth transition of like, oh, that's exactly how I saw that. So I'm. I'm really excited for those kind of moments. Yeah, like yeah. one of the, the goals I had with this uh, short story was for it to kind of like align with the first alpha that we're releasing soon. There's not a whole lot of content in there for you to 
sink your teeth in do to get engaged by. But at least with this, it'll give you something to be thinking about as you're playing and testing. Yeah, I think that will add a lot to it, actually. So you know, when these are out, I encourage everyone to go and check them out. Uh, man, I thought you did a great job because you and I had sort of talked early <laughs> on about you know what this first story was going to be about. But it was really just like this <laughs> kernel of an idea. And then like you went and built this like whole big thing around it um, and expanded it out. And so I didn't know what to expect. And, uh, so that was that was like great just from my perspective to see like to see how you turn this little idea into, you know, this like pretty big short story. <laughs> yeah, I I'm typically a like outliner when I before I write, I want to know like beat by beat what happens. Uh, but for some reason, like the the idea we had was such a small yeah, idea, it <laughs> like it was such a like a premise. It wasn't even like an idea. It was just a premise that I, I ended up like discovery writing or just writing as I like word by word without any preparation ahead of time. And I'm really happy with how it yeah. turned out. Great job. Cool. Well, you guys can be uh, expecting those short stories soon. Uh, the other things that we were kind of talking about beforehand was uh, I, I know speaking to actual stories and people that uh, think and talking of actual stories and things that people are going to be actually seeing like the written words and stuff is uh, we've been working on the dialogue editor, haven't we? We have, and the dialogue editor is actually complete. There's, you know, some. There was one major bug that we found in it when we were testing it, and that has been fixed as of uh, this this evening. So Eric and I went through, um, I, I guess, a couple of days ago, and we put in a lot of the dialogue um, for the game just to test it out and make sure everything's working. And we sort of uh, had to, you know, set some of the values for things like the cooldown timers <laughs> really low just for testing purposes. So. When the player's playing the game, we don't want text <laughs> popping up all the time. But when we're testing it, we also don't want to wait five minutes to see the next um, line item of text come up. <laughs> so, you know, we've got to go back in now and set some more realistic parameters for the actual players to experience in the game. But it's all looking really good, looking like we're going to wrap up the dialogue part of the game for the alpha pretty soon. Yeah, it's awesome. And I was actually there when you guys were kind of doing it because <laughs> uh, you were actually uh, streaming on Twitch, which is the other thing that we were kind of <laughs> discussing. Uh, yes. and, and that's been kind of a journey in of itself because I think it's all Eric's fault. <laughs> so <laughs> Twitch recently expanded its subscription program, which if you don't use Twitch, basically if you're the like viewer, you can, um, subscribe for $5 and the streamer gets $2, I think 49 cents just per subscription every month. Um, so I told Sledge like, Hey, this might be something we want to look into at some point. Because we need money because we're an indie dev. Uh, and he, you just took off with it. <laughs> I, I became a little, um, yeah, I became a little obsessed with it. I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I, I realized you became obsessed when I, when I saw that you immediately got a new camera and you, were, you, know, you got the, uh, what was it, like the pro camera? Yes. I did. I got, I got the Logitech, what is it, like CS922 Pro. <laughs> but the real, the real key was like before I even had my camera, I was doing all this complicated <laughs> setup so I could stream from my desktop connecting to my laptop to use my laptop uh, <laughs> camera because I didn't have another camera available. So I had like this what? complex team viewer connection with a bunch of delays I had to add in to make everything match up. And so, yeah, but I'm really excited about this idea of streaming and I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but um, I've been sort of educating myself and just like jumping on and doing some streaming and it's been a lot of fun. So I think it might be a, a pretty interesting way to sort of work on growing our audience and let them, see Gears of Eden and, and see us play some other games that we like that are either related to Gears of Eden or, you know, just us having some fun and games that we like to play in our downtime. So um, check us out. We are on Twitch now. It's twitch.tv slash Gears of Eden. And hopefully, uh, I definitely will be on there, I guess. But um, <laughs> Eric's been on there streaming with me and Michael, you joined uh, on the chat a couple times. So we hope to get all the dev team involved and uh, like do some group streaming on there. Yeah, no, I'm definitely excited. Uh, at, you know, so we were we were doing a little uh, streaming uh, yesterday, uh, and I will say it was probably one of those like moments as you're doing something that you become you realize how excited you are <laughs> uh, because we actually we you know it, it you know and it may seem kind of insignificant to like some other people people who have more experience with uh, streaming and all that stuff, but we actually had. Uh, uh, a viewer who was kind of being very interactive, you know, being very uh, conversational with us. Uh, and so kind of a huge shout out to technical fool. Uh, but man, it, 
you know, just kind of having that interaction with someone else who's not part of the team and who, you know, showing interest in all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was, it was, it was awesome to get that kind of feeling in. Oh my gosh. It felt, <laughs> it felt so good to like actually be getting some feedback from someone because, you know, we've been like, we're, we're, we're working hard to develop content for our audience, whether it's the blog post or the short stories or doing this podcast. And, you know, we're just still at an early stage, so we're still growing the audience and we're not yet getting a lot of feedback. Um, and you know, we hope that progresses as we continue developing content, getting better at it and getting a, a bigger and larger audience and, and getting some actual test out to people where they can play the game. Um, but sort of like, yeah, that last night in that stream was the first like really good interaction of feedback we had from someone and it felt so good. So I'm looking forward to, you know, finding ways to have more of that and Hope you guys will be on there too. <laughs> yeah, well, because it's you know it's very important to get that fan feedback because we don't want to be this weird kind of echo yes. chamber that you know we're just yes. kind of saying yes, yes, that's <laughs> awesome, yes, that's awesome, just kind of this weird yes. se- self patting on the back, uh, you know. So we you know we want to be challenged, we want our ideas, you know, we want to experience new ideas that we may have not thought of because you know we're we're not you know omnipotent and have like the best vision for what this immediately should be, you know. Uh, so it. It's very important for us to get the feedback, which is, you know, why we ask you guys to uh, comment, do do whatever you can just to kind of let us know that you're there because we, we, we want to talk to you. Yeah. And Twitch is a great, like we, we experienced last night, like Twitch is a great way for people to get on and watch us play the game and ask questions and we can answer them. And then, you know, also if, if you, ha- you know, have an ideal for something that you see that might be able to, you know, be done differently or be done better or just, you know, an addition here or there. Um, you know, like you mentioned technical fool was on last night and he had a lot of great comments and a lot of ideas. And so that's definitely something, you know, we, we're sort of doing this game as a community. We want to do it with you guys, with the community. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, Twitch might be a good way for us to connect and have some more interaction and have those experiences. Yeah. So that's what's been going on with uh, Gears Development this week. Uh, we want to take a quick moment. Uh, this is uh, a reminder before we head into our next segment. Uh, if you're enjoying the show so far, help us out by leaving a review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find us. And be sure to leave a comment on our website at www.gearsofeden.com to let us know what you think. This is to help us get a better understanding of how we can improve and bring you a better podcast. And with that, back to the show. So now we'll be discussing something more general yet uplifting, inspiration. So I've asked the guys here to give us an example of inspiration from their own lives. Uh, this can come from either entertainment, news, the internet, really anything that does simply one thing, inspire. This is to give you guys an idea of how we feel our creativity. So Sledge, what's been your inspiration this week? All right. Well, I feel like I'm always talking about space news related stuff, <laughs> but you know, to be honest, like, I mean, that's a big part of why I'm making this game about space. And, you know, I think we all love space and sci-fi. And so Like, you know, real news about stuff that's actually going on in the world of space exploration always gets me excited and inspires me. So my space motivation and inspiration this week comes from none other than Elon Musk. And I was recently reading about his plan to get people to Mars and basically to build a city of a million people on Mars, which is fascinating. Um, But what I didn't know is that basically his everything he does in life is centered around this philosophy has that humans need to be a multi-planetary species. So he's really sold on this vision of getting to Mars. And he had this great quote where he says, you know, the only reason that he tries to be successful in business and to, uh, to amass assets and to grow wealth is basically to play a part in getting humans off the planet and onto Mars. And so, you know, even with SpaceX, the, the small steps they're taking now, his long-term goal is to get people on Mars. And he actually has a plan where he thinks that, uh, we can start sending people to Mars in by like 2020 um, or 2025, somewhere in that range. Okay. And he, so he thinks from 40 to 60 years after we depart and go to Mars that he can build a self-sustaining colony there. And that would just sort of future-proof the species is his point of view. Yeah, that, uh, you know, I always hear about that like high-minded thinking of, you know, basically just trying to push humanity as a species into, yeah, like moving into other planets and then, uh, when we start doing that, we can start moving into other systems and then other galaxies and other universes. And, you know, it's, it's basically just everything that he's doing is for that end goal in mind. That sounds pretty awesome. I, I didn't actually know that he was thinking of doing a million people on Mars. Yeah, that sounds crazy, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, that's a lot of people. <laughs> it's everyone he hates. Just get them all out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just get everyone out. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, the idea is that you have to have a certain number of people that there to be self-sufficient. So, mm-hmm. you know, it wouldn't quite work if we had a Mars, you know, city and it was dependent on Earth and then the Earth gets wiped out and then all the people on Mars would die too. So, like, it really have you have to have enough people there that you can, you know, divide and conquer and, and have division of labor and all those it's things. It's also primarily, it comes down to a genetics thing where you need enough, yeah, exactly. you need enough diversifying genes so you don't, you know. Make things gross. <laughs> so we don't, <laughs> right? <sighs> you know, so basically where we don't have, you know, like weird deformed mutants on Mars that we have to oh God. all of a sudden. What if yeah, we yeah, make exactly. the Martians? <laughs> <laughs> we, we will be the Martians. No, but like the way we know it. <laughs> like little green like green to, to turn green yeah that actually ties into like uh the very original idea we had for this project because we had we, the idea was that it was like i think 40 years in the future when there was just no more resources in the planet. we run out of platinum was one of like the topic point or conversation points we had when we were first laying it out and that the basic idea was like we could no longer sustain ourselves on this planet with just the planet. Yeah, and so there was like this race for resources on, you know, other bodies. Yeah, I still like that idea. And I do think that um, like even now this story, it sort of sets up like eventually it's like the first baby steps into the universe of, the yeah. of Eden as well. It's just, uh, you know, it's just making me think that we need to make uh, Elon, uh, Elon Musk uh, rovers. Like he was able to maintain his, <laughs> his sentience and... You know, it's it's been able to travel all this way in the future. Yeah, it's like all the you know heads and jars in the future. <laughs> yeah, our, our version of it will be rover. And the entire time, there are rovers around him trying to like, make him seem personable when he's just like some mega nerd who's just saving the world his own way. <laughs> there seems like there's a new article every month of like someone trying to like, hey, look, he's just like us. He like zip lining and having conversations but whenever he gets on stage it's the most awkward thing because he doesn't do that he's just like i know math and i'm really good at that and i want to help yeah ma- making him seem like he's kind of like a james bond character just like you know skydiving out of and he airplanes. has the name for it that is a cool scientist name musk Elon Musk. it's true it sounds like a bad cologne yeah, that's what i was thinking too <laughs> Well, now we're just great clone. trash talking Elon Musk on this podcast. Oh, no. Oh, we don't want to do that. I'm not. I said it was good. I want to smell like Elon Musk is Musk. <laughs> like a Tesla. Yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so well, let's move on to the uh, next uh, next topic. Uh, Eric, what's been your inspiration for this week? Oh, okay. Um, so my inspiration is... The inspiration of having done something. Getting stuff done. Yeah, getting stuff done. Because as I'm as I'm working on this project, I also have a side project of my own where I'm writing a book. And I've had this, like, the, bu- the book is broken up different, like, points of views, like, different characters given their own perspectives. And I had this one character's perspective that I just couldn't write for some reason. Like, it, I've been working on it for over a month, and that's far too long for the character's level of involvement in the story. Yeah, so you just like have this huge mental block. It was a total <laughs> you... mental block. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I uh, I sat down. And I decided like over the next three days, I need to write the like, the ten thousand words remaining of this character's perspective. Um, and it, it was rough. Like one of the days, I had so much to do, like to catch up, because the first day I hadn't done nearly enough. Um, but by the end of that day, my head actually hurt. I just wanted to lay down and close my eyes. But by the end of that weekend. <laughs> I had finished, I actually wrote, like, it's actually 8,000 words in, being a little shorter than I expected, but I, I finished that thing, and ever since then, I've been, like, writing like crazy. I finished the uh, the first short story for Gears of Eden that week, uh, and yeah, it's been, the, my productivity has been way up, just by dude, that, accomplishing. Yeah, that's awesome, just kind of like, you're able to make a huge accomplishment, and then, like, the floodgates were opened, yes. and, like, just nothing could stop you. So, Eric, what was it about, like, imposing this 10,000 word requirement on yourself that really helped you get through that block back before I hit this weird period of my life where I couldn't write barely anything. Um, I would, I would write like four or five, sometimes 6,000 words a day. Uh, and it was like, that's just how I wrote. Like I wouldn't write every day a week, but I would sit down through the weekend, through the few days I had off uh, and just binge write. And so this week, that weekend where I, I where I did all this, it was like bringing myself back to what I do. It was like bringing myself back to like my standard 
position, and I, I'm very happy to be back. <laughs> just, just kind of getting like back, back in your habits. So, yes, yeah. and, and 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 I and I find that those kind of things usually work is just being able to give yourself a break, let your brain kind of have like this cool down period, and like reset yourself, so you could just get back into it. Like, oh yeah, you know, like nothing almost never happened. It went a little longer than I wanted it to. Like there was like there were some days I could write maybe 500 words i was proud of that yeah and that's just it's such a leap backwards for me <laughs> yeah but you, but you know that's the important thing was that you just kept going yes with it. even 500 words like if it isn't what you're like used to it's still 500 words you've written and that is yeah it's so much more than zero it's, yeah it's way more than zero <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> times were zero it's amazing that's right <laughs> i don't know if the math it'll take forever that. to write a book at 500 words a day but it takes Far more time to do it if you're not writing at all. It will not happen. <laughs> what if it does, though? <laughs> what if it does? You spice some monkeys, put them in a typewriter, and you're good, right? That's how it works. I think, yes, you put them inside of the typewriter, and that works. <laughs> not, them. Yeah, I think that's how it works. I'm not yeah. sure how it works, but I'm not going to I'm not gonna argue with the science. I'm not going to argue with no, Elon Musk right. over here. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so speaking of that, Nick, uh, what was your inspiration for this week? Uh, just kind of an article I just happened to cross from a um, fantasy writing group I'm uh, following Facebook. They kind of just went over some tropes that are a little bit overused in sci-fi and fantasy. It's definitely some things that I would like to avoid when we're doing Gears of Eden. Um, just like info dumps. And I, <laughs> I, I think back to... Um, me talking with Eric about uh, Mark Lawrence's book, um, Prince of Thorns, and how he he would describe in like a sentence or two what other authors take a page to do, and it was actually something I really appreciated sometimes <laughs> because he would just get it done, and but in a clever way. You'd be like, "Wait, did that just okay? Yeah, that happened. All right, cool." So um, I don't know. It's got a lot of good tips. Well, the, yeah, they're tropes that they you just shouldn't be kind of pigeonholing into things. Yeah, basically, like right. her message throughout this is that there's these rules that you're not supposed to do, but it's but more of a discussion about sometimes. like why those rules exist, so that while you don't want to necessarily always break those rules, it's you, she wants you to understand when to break those rules. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Well, I and I think that's important to know like why tropes are tropes and like why people find them. Uh, like so enthralling and why people kind of cling on to these uh, you know certain subjects so it's pretty cool yeah so that uh, that brings it to me now uh, my inspiration for this week is actually another podcast uh, kind of a shout out to uh, the Adventure Zone podcast which is actually a D&D podcast between three brothers and their father uh, which which is very fun to listen to if you guys are about that kind of stuff. I'd highly suggest listening to it. But uh, the main reason I wanted to bring it up was, you know, me kind of listening to th this stuff and us having our own podcasts. It's made me a little more uh, analytical when going over podcasts and listening and hearing what people do and what uh, tricks they use to, uh, you know, kind of keep you entertained. And uh, one of the first things I noticed was the, uh, the DM. Uh, he actually composed his own music. For his adventure, so you know, because he always wanted the players to kind of get immersed into the uh, into the story, and he just found it was like, well, I I guess it, you know, since I'm doing most of the stuff anyway, I might as well just compose my own music. And he's actually got like whole like albums out for each of these like different <laughs> arcs and all that stuff. And I was like just oh, amazed wow. at him yeah. doing all this stuff. And you know, just kind of hearing some of the more technical stuff as well. You know what? You know how they kind of approach like the beginning of the podcast, how they approach uh, approach the uh, like the ad reads or any of that kind of stuff. It, it was just cool to listen to and see how someone who's been successful for like, uh, I think they started like around uh, 2014. So people who have been successful for three years, just seeing how they initially, like how they initially started and what they do now. It's been like a huge plethora of information and, and it's kind of got me more excited for our podcast. I'm always yeah. amazed by people who like have this thing that they like, they love doing. That's just like their thing to do. And they, yeah. act, they figure out a way to turn that into a meaningful and profitable career for themselves so that they can, you know, make money to live in a home and have food while still being totally happy with, like, that thing they love. Yeah. And, w and what's cool is uh, – so they have another podcast, which is me, my brother, uh, my brother, my 
Brother and Me, I think is what it's called. Oh, uh, Mobin Bam. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's uh so it's them. And then they just like, well, you know, since we're having enough success with this one, let's you know, we want to kind of do a D and D thing and see if this has enough success where we can just continue doing this. And yeah, they've been finding success in just doing podcasts, having fun playing Dungeons and Dragons and, you know, mm. being able to say, Yeah, I, I can eat food and live under a house because of that. So that's awesome. Wow. Yeah, that's very cool. So yeah, so these are just some of the things that uh, we use for inspiration on a day-to-day basis. Uh, it's not necessarily motivation, but it helps us get our creative juices flowing and get our minds on the right track. Before we sign off, uh, let's talk a little bit about the games we've been playing. Uh, and you know, this is to give you guys some insight into what we like and what we use to relax. Uh, so Slush, uh, tell us a little bit about the games you've been playing this week. All right, well, I haven't been playing a lot of games this week, but... You know, I've still been on, like I said, this sort of inspiration from Space News and all the SpaceX launches in the last few weeks. And so I've I've gotten back into playing Kerbal. And, you know, also like last time I did talk about Kerbal a little bit and, and you asked me, you know, which kind of player am I? And I kind of like <laughs> plans everything out or I just like launch a rocket and hope it gets there. And I <laughs> kind of launches a rocket and hope it gets there. Um, but I actually installed Kerbal Engineer. Oh, lately, really? I've been trying to be a little more methodic in planning and... Um, been uh, you know doing a little bit of that so now you can feel like the the, the guilt lift off your shoulders of all those like you know drif- drifting kerbals a little bit more of a true nerd now so <laughs> actually crunching some numbers and doing some math while i'm playing kerbal so it, it's it is a lot of fun um the only other game i've really played lately besides you know some standard you know overwatch and rocket league and that sort of thing is um i got back into stardew valley for a little bit and um, still just plodding along. I, I made it to the desert for the first time, so I'm exploring <laughs> that. And um, there's actually a lot of things in that game that I, I, I like how that game um, sort of has this balance where you can like really do the grinding stuff, like the everyday farming and, and go exploring. And then there's also these little story elements that are laced throughout with, you know, building relationships with different characters and like the grandfather coming back and all this stuff. Um, and in that sort of way, it was like one of the early inspirations for Gears of Eden because we wanted to have a game where you both had, you know, like sort of the things that you want to do, like go mine for resources, which is very like Minecraft sort of gameplay. But then also like have these narrative elements and add some missions in and some relationships and things like that. So it's it's kind of interesting how you can find inspiration in games that are like completely different genres and completely different play styles, but they're still like kernels of things that... You, you can look at between two games and compare them and see a relationship. So it's interesting you actually bring up Stardew Valley because the uh, Steam Summer Sale actually just recently ended. Uh, and it was one of the games that I picked up among... Yes! Uh, which... Well, you know, one of what, the best space farming games out there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know... <laughs> you, know you know, it's... And that, that's kind of like the thought process I kind of went into when I was looking at it because I was afraid it was one of those games that you had to, like... Uh, put so many hours of grinding into it before you can get anything out of it. So, and you guys kind of talked me into it when uh, uh, we were discussing the game earlier and how you could have, you know, like you said earlier, just like those little stories that you could just pick throughout and just have fun with it. Yeah. I will say Stardew is my, like the most chill game I play and it's, it's my go-to hammock gaming game. So (laughs) you, you guys haven't figured out hammock gaming, you get a hammock, you know, you bring your laptop out and you're just chilling like with a game like Stardew and you're set for, you know, an hour or so. <laughs> I love that it's this game where there's so much to do. Like you could do basically like whatever you want to do. And so if you see something in Stardew Valley, you can probably, well, I don't want to say do it, but there's something you can do there. But you don't have to do any of it. Like You could literally just stand yeah, in yeah. place and the world will unfold in its own way. Or you can just completely focus on fishing and leave everything else alone and you'll still be able to just play <laughs> it is not yeah, demanding yeah. at all and like each of those separate areas has these little like you know rare items or like rewards that you can chase after so like each little thing can be fulfilling in its own right maybe i'll have to give it a shot i mean it's in my steam library it's very good and i'll be sure to update you guys when <laughs> i uh able to get my hands on it uh so eric uh what have you been playing this week so you started this off by saying, like, we're talking about the things we like a little bit and, and that, but I I didn't like what I've played this week. Oh, really? It, yeah, because I got the new Prey. Oh, no. And have I went in with such high expectations, not high, high hopes, not like expecting amazingness from it, just a solid, 
Bioshocky or Half Life y kind of shooter where you go through like an enclosed space and shoot some bad guys. So so what happened? Was it just not what you expected? It it was that, but it seemed like there was so much like mechanically or design wise that was at odds with itself. Really? There's the there's like the combat aspect. And the combat is totally designed around like that sort of half life or Bioshock kind of thing where there's a bad guy and they have health and you need to shoot them until the health goes away. Mm -hmm. But the tools they give you to accomplish that goal don't facilitate that. Like the tools they give you don't really work with that sort of mentality. And the game itself doesn't really react to those tools in the way that it should. Right now, like where I stopped playing, uh, I had a glue gun thing, which like shot these balls of glue at the enemies, like Friesman's place. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Those look pretty awesome. Yeah, totally awesome. And then you go up to it and you whack it or you shoot with your pistol that you eventually get. Spoilers. <laughs> uh, and I, I like that mechanic a lot. But the way that the, char- like the enemies react to you doing that to them, it feels like they weren't designed to react to it in a way that acknowledges those mechanics. Huh. So like they just don't, like, don't slow down or anything? They just... Yeah, they freeze up from the glue and then you whack them and they're totally free. Like they can do whatever they want then. Oh, okay. And you kind of huh. expect, like, given the way that that mechanic works, they would kind of stumble around like, oh, I'm now I'm out of the glue. Or something that, like, doesn't immediately have you being blasted with fire by this weird fiery shadow monster. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. And so that was, like, so that made combat just really unsatisfying because it's like, sweet, I did what I had to do and I lost 30 health points and my suit's broken now. And then, like, the whole level design bugged me because, like, it was designed very open like you, you you go to this big room at one point and there's all these ladder not ladders stairs and rooms just to go into but there's not a whole lot of point to go to any of those rooms except for the one that it's telling you to go to i mean you can get like some loot like some supplies like ammo maybe or a health pack so you're saying it kind of falls under that uh problem that we discussed a couple podcasts ago which is all about that empty space and not being able to use it and make it effective yeah it's like it, it's really refreshing because there's a lot of very cool design decisions like even just from a gameplay perspective there's very cool decisions made and it feels like there was a lot of really good developers working on this game but for some reason they just didn't come together in the way that it's so trying to come together yeah and i don't know what i'm doing in the game like i don't know what the goal is like i assume <laughs> survive all the aliens that are on the spaceship but, like, the game hasn't really given me any sort of indication. There's just like, whoa, this is all going on? All right. Yeah, I, I, I can I can <laughs> completely understand that feeling because that, that's how I felt at first for uh, for the game that I played this week. Uh, so what did you play this week? Well, so uh, we were speaking a little bit of how I got Stardew Valley, but I haven't played that yet. What I did uh, get my hands on, though, was uh, was one of the indie games during the summer sale, which was Hyper Light Drifter. The way it was described to me, which is actually by by you, Eric, which was it was kind of like Dark Souls, but you know in the in the eight bit format. Yeah. And so that, I, you know, I, that kind of instantly caught my interest, so I wanted to give it a try. And you know, just like looking at the uh, trailer and looking at the gameplay, it just seemed like really like a cool classic game that I would have fun with. And uh, so my initial reactions were like, "Oh my god, I regret this," because the very <laughs> first thing it did was it showed me like this two minute uh, like cutscene of like all this random stuff, there was no subtitles, there was no like <laughs> any kind of story narration at all, uh, and anything that was like written, like the written language was like these weird yeah. scribbles. Uh, <laughs> and then having to play the game for like the next like thirty minutes, having to not play, not play, suddenly get stuck, and then like I'm like vomiting, and then I die, but then I come back. Like it was just like so many things were going on, like. That I had no control over in the first five minutes. I was a little, I was, I was actually on edge, just like wondering what was going to happen with this game. <laughs> uh, but once I started playing and kind of just accepted the fact that I wasn't going to understand anything from this, I actually started having fun with it. Because, so you know, like the story there isn't really there. It kind of just gives you like these pictures, and like you're supposed to kind of be a smart person and figure it <laughs> out. So. Uh, <laughs> luckily I'm smart enough to realize <laughs> that I need to head in a certain direction. You passed the test. Yes, I passed the test. So I was able to head in a certain direction and that was, you know, like the continuum of the storyline and all that stuff. You know, I love the gameplay. It's super like fluid and it feels, uh, it fe- you know, I feel powerful when I'm able to kind of get the controls just right and like hit the enemies. And uh, man, I, I just, I don't know what to say, what else to say about it. It's, 
it, you know, it was one of those weird like 180 turns that yeah. you could possibly have for a video game. And I've actually just been absolutely loving it ever since then. So I'm I'm curious. Um, I got I got a question for both of you on these games because you both sort of say they start you out without explaining too much of the story or what's going on, and then that that makes you a little bit confused. Do you think it's just because of the pacing where, like, you don't have the time to figure it out slowly, and maybe that's the path they're going down? Because there are games like, you know, Portal and a little bit of what we're doing with Gears of Eden, where you know we're not trying to hand feed the story with a bunch of cutscenes. So. You know, how do you compare that to like the games that you're playing where that felt uncomfortable versus games where they do that well and they don't give you a lot of story, but they give you the room and the pace to figure it out um, and make it feel comfortable. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I'll, I'll say like just having recently experienced it, I think my issue at first was kind of like the lack of information. Uh, so it wasn't anything like in terms of controls because I was able to like they had like this kind of like tutorial level. Uh, where you figured out what buttons you should be pressing, and uh, and then like I ultimately I just kind of went to the menu, just seeing if there's anything else I could possibly do, uh, and it was all there. I think that it was just the lack of information at first. You know, a picture of uh, basically kind of like a diamond, and then showing it on a map, making it point left, was basically just like their their way of telling me that I needed to head west of the town. Basically, just explore west of town and just find what I could do with that space. Okay. And, it, you know, so it was kind of jarring just having to, you know, feeling like there should have been more. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and in the case of Prey, basically the premise that, like, they sell it to you with this is that you're in the space station, things aren't what they seem, and there's aliens attacking. And that's fine. It's like, it's a fine premise. But it's kind of cool. It's, like, mysterious. <laughs> it's, the, it's the reason people buy it. Yeah, it's cool. It's a, it's a good hook. But yeah. for the first like three hours of the game, that's all they really give you. <laughs> and there's at one point where like they're about to give you information about the game, and then the thing breaks. Like the thing that's telling you the information is breaking. It's like great now I have to go on this whole other part of the game to go find this part or talk to this guy or something who can fix my machine that's telling me what I'm supposed to care about. And that involves like spacewalks. And going to these big warehouses. And there's just so much to do before you get to the point where it's like, okay, how do we handle this situation? Yeah, for that, it just seems like uh, a case of them kind of adding like a filler missions that you have to do before you can yeah. actually do the real mission. Yeah. And then there's this whole like thing that feels like it's maybe the point of the game where you're trying to find the people who are like still alive on the ship, maybe? I don't know. At one point, I had to go through this huge list of everyone on the ship and see who was dead and who was alive. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just like, right around the corner is a big bad guy that I'm looking at this right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's so frustrating. <laughs> the, the the turning point for, for me was, like I said, when I was able to accept that, that the cryptic messages were basically what you had to do. So I felt, I did feel very smart when I realized that I did have to head west and I did have to, <laughs> uh, you know, explore the map and find what I can uh, to kind of progress through the uh, through the story per se, but I think it also it was kind of the point of the game to be very cryptic, be very uh, you know have as little story as possible. So it's I think it's clear that the uh, development team of the Hyperlight Drifters they're in the mindset of less is more, uh, and it definitely works for that game. In games of the style and like Dark Souls is like the prime example of it. They have this story that exists out there. But they don't. I feel like they don't want it to like be the focus of it. Like I feel like they want the thing you're doing right now, like handling this boss or this um, feeling of being lost. They want that to be the story you're feeling right now. And then after you've had the whole like adventure of the game, you have all these pieces that you're able to put together if you're so inclined uh, to tell a larger narrative. I, actually, I think you. You hit the nail on the head for for hyperlight drifters at least, where you're supposed to have that sense of loss and not exactly know what you're doing, and you're just kind of having to put together these small little pieces to you know try to figure out what's happening. Yeah, it's it's a very effective style because it makes you like care first and foremost about the thing you're doing right now, and then it also like because you have that investment into that, you are able to like buy into the larger parts of the story that are perhaps more abstract, but still like causing the situation that you're in. 
I'm not a big Dark Souls fan, but I really like what it's doing for game design and storytelling in the medium. Same. I'm I'm in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, so so that's the game I've been playing this week. Uh, we kind of skipped ahead. So, uh, Nick, what have you been playing this week? I've been lame and decided that story is for suckers. Except for when it comes to Gear of the <laughs> So uh, I've only played Overwatch a little bit. A handful of rounds, but yeah. The boring person naming Overwatch is my game this week. <laughs> uh, honestly, if I can get Farah, I'm going to be Farah probably every time. Like that air superiority? Oh yeah. god, yeah. It's just so much fun because everyone else is so ground-based. It's just a lot of fun to be, you know, up in the air pissing everybody off. <laughs> I love playing with you because I know... Because I play Mercy when I uh, play Overwatch. Death from above. And I love that I can always just like, escape to you when things are getting hairy for me. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I was I had some pretty good rounds as Roadhog as well. Yeah, yeah Roadhog was the first tank that clicked with me. Yeah, that hook is good though. Yeah, it's that it's actually very interesting because uh, they came out with the Reaper and Roadhog update, so now Roadhog can't one shot people, and Reaper can now survive and start you know hitting Roadhog pretty good and heal at the same exact time. Mm-hmm. So we uh, we were recently playing a game, and I got hooked by Roadhog, and I was actually playing Reaper that one time. And yeah, yeah, I was not afraid one bit. You know, normally, normally I'd be kind of like on that character. I'd like be spamming the uh, like the wraith form mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, button, just trying to escape and see, and hopefully I make it. But like I just I took it and just immediately, all right, now I'm closer to him. I can just shoot him right there in the belly and just kill. <laughs> Thank him. you. You've brought me to you. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you got me within range. This is exactly what I want. <laughs> yeah. Which, which is actually funny because a fair got that earlier too, uh, Nick, where they just kind of flew right into my guns. So. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I try not to fly into guns. Or just stay away from the Reaper. <laughs> Fair shouldn't be anywhere near Reaper, like, ever at yeah. any time. So, really, that should be a fight Fair <laughs> wins every time. I saw someone who was playing Fair get killed by a Reaper. It was... I don't think you were there, Michael. But they, uh, <laughs> the response to it was just like perplexion like they were while they were dead they were just like typing in a chat like how did you do that because they were all they were way up in the air the reaper had just decided to fire them for a while <laughs> yeah i do not disparage you one bit for having just played that this weekend this week because it is such a fun game yeah it's easy to just jump into and just do a little bit and just yeah. get back out so yeah and i think that definitely has led to the success of the watch just oh yeah that exact thing mm-hmm. so yeah now the gamers that. aren't like 12 and have all the time in the world now they're like adults and have jobs that they have to do it is very nice to just play for half an hour maybe and have a huge fun experience uh so uh that wraps it up for this week uh thanks for listening guys uh so once again if you have any questions or comments we'd love to hear from you and what you think of the podcast uh you can contact us and find out more about gears of eden Uh, at www.gearsofeden.com or on Twitter or Facebook. Also, if you are interested in finding out more about anything that we've discussed today, uh, you can find the links in the blog entry for this podcast on our website. So thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new edition of Reaching Eden. Until then, we're the Gears of Eden development team, and we're Reaching Eden. We hope you join us.